It's still morning, so good morning, church. Always a blessing to share God's word with us. And if you are joining online, we welcome you and we hope you are blessed as well as we uh, share God's word together. We've been reading through um, the New Testament this year. Um, I'd like to encourage you as much as possible to um, follow in this reading. God has a plan uh, to continue to speak to us uh, through this. And we are looking at the book of First Corinthians right now. And uh, last week we had Helen here who spoke to us about... Um, marriage and behavior in marriage and and as well this morning we had uh, Lizzie who was sharing with us part of what I was going to share today which is great um, how the spirit of God works in 1st Corinthians chapter 9 uh, she was making reference to one of the areas I was going to be addressing or speaking about today so today I'm looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and I'm the title of what I'll be talking about is, is For the Sake of the Gospel, For the Sake of the Gospel. I'm just going to read um, 1 Corinthians 9, it should come up on the screen as well. From verse 1, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense for, to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a, take a believing wife along with us? As do the other. Apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who lack the right not to not work for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of his grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? Does the law say the same thing? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have the right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? Though we, though, but we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple? And that those who serve at the altar, sharing what is offered on the altar. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I have not used any of these rights. Am I not writing this in the... And I am not writing this in the hope that you will do these, these things to me. For I would rather die rather than allow anyone to deprive me of this boast. But when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I'm compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Justice, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not making full use of my right as a preacher of the gospel. Verse 19. Though I'm free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those that the law, to those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, 
so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I become, became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in his blessing. Fairly long passage, um, and the Lord bless the reading uh, of his words in our hearts. Amen. Like I said, I'm talking about for the sake of the gospel. And as we've read in this uh, passage, in the book of Corinthians, we know that the Corinthian church was a very uh, troubled church. It was a church that a lot of things were happening. It was a, Corinth was a city with um, a lot of political uh, relevance. It was a city devoted to idols, at least 12 temples. So the church in, in Corinth was founded by Paul at about A.D. 51 uh, to A.D. Uh, 51 to 52. So that was shortly after the Lord's, uh, the Lord resurrected. He heard about the problems in the church from various sources and he decided to address the problems, or at least ten problems that he addressed, ranging from division to sexual immorality, eating food offered to idols, marital problems, disorder in church, meeting in worship, and misuse of spiritual gifts. When we look at this letter of Paul, we may be tempted to think this is a long time ago, but we know this is relevant today. What's happening in Corinth is relevant Today is similar to what's happening in our society. We have all these problems in the society and in the church. So the letter is as relevant today as it was at the time. Christians, we are still influenced by what happened in the society. The society a church is in has a lot of influence on the church. See, so problems like immaturity. Instability, divisions, jealousy, envy, lawsuits, marital difficulties, sexual immorality, and the misuse of spiritual gifts is all still present in our church, in our society. And the Corinthian church was a very, a very uh, troubled church. Uh, problems, very terrible to talk about, like incest happening within the church. So Paul was writing to address this in chapter 8. He was talking about eating food, offering to idols, how people take their liberty too far without considering people, other people who has weak conscience. So in, 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 in Paul was encouraging the people to put the law of law first ahead of their liberty. And this is the center of what I'm sharing with you today. We've got liberty as God's children, but God wants us to consider our liberty and right with respect to how does this impact others? In exercising our rights that we've, we've got in Christ, how does this affect others? Paul, was say, for, Paul stated that if eating meat would make my brother to stumble, I'd rather not eat meat. I'll be a vegan all, all the days of my life. So that Paul could go that far because he didn't want his freedom to, to lead somebody else away from Christ. Like Jesus himself said, he said, if anyone that makes any of these to, to stumble, it's better for the person not to be born. That's one of my greatest fears, that my life hindering somebody to come into Jesus. So in chapter 9, he began to talk about his own right as an apostle. His right to live off the gospel. His right to marry. Paul was talking about even the, the law encourages that those who serve in the temple should live by the temple. The church should look after the pastors, those that serve. But he decided not to take this right because of how it might affect his message. And when I read this, I remember, I just, it just comes to my mind, some ch churches in some countries where the pastors live so large, so large, so wealthy, 
and members, the members, the members are struggling in abject poverty. I, could, I couldn't imagine Paul seeing such. And a lot of them will use passages, some of the letters Paul has written to, to actually support why they live such large lives. And I, I'm sure it will break Paul's heart. Paul went to the extent that I don't want to take anything from you from the church of Corinth because I don't want that to be an obstacle. I will walk, walk as a tent maker just to support himself so he won't be a hindrance. It doesn't mean a, a pastor being supported by the church is wrong for him. He thought he would be a hindrance. Even taking a wife, he's not wrong to have, to have a marriage. He thought having a marriage will hinder him from preaching the gospel. So for Paul, what was more important was the gospel. What was more important was the message. So for Paul, the most important thing is whatever I want to do, will it help or hinder the gospel? That was the most important thing to Paul. And for us as Christians, for us today, even in everything that has to do with us, every aspect of our lives, what is most important, what should be most important to us, our primary focus should be the gospel of Jesus. What I'm doing, what I, do, I want to do, in what way does this enhance? In what way does it hinder the gospel of Jesus? He didn't care about his right or his freedom. He decided to lay his right down. He decided to jettison his own right. He decided to sacrifice his right and his freedom on the altar for him to preach the gospel. For him, the most important thing was his liberty to preach the gospel. His freedom to preach the gospel. So his own personal right and freedom, he decided to let it go. Even if it means not eating meat. Even if it means not getting married. When I was reading this and I was preparing this, I, was just, I, just, I, I had to spend time to pray for myself that God would give me the kind of heart that Paul had. Because for Paul, what was most important with him in his life was the gospel. He lived the gospel. He slept the gospel. He ate the gospel to the point when he's writing to the people, he, say, he will say, according to my gospel. So he owned the gospel. So he had a heart that I just trust the Lord will give to me. I trust the Lord will give to us that our hearts, our lives will be dictated, will be influenced. Our life, what we do, where we go, Everything about our life will be dictated by the gospel, by, the, by the, the sharing of the gospel. And this is so important. And then he says, though I'm free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone. See? To win as many as possible. So he was free, but he decided to, if it means putting my freedom down, I'm willing to do that so that I can win some. So the Jews have become like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like under the law, though I myself am not under the law. It, didn't, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean compromise. It means as long as it is not against the law of Jesus. Paul was free from all men. No one could exercise jurisdiction or compulsion over him. Yet, he brought himself under bondage to all people in order that he might win more. He could if he could make a concession, this is the key point. If he could make a concession without sacrificing divine truth, he would do it in order to win souls for Christ. So that's what he meant by to the Jew, I became like a Jew. He didn't mean compromise. If he meant for Titus, for Timothy to be circumcised, even though he was not a Jew, he was ready to encourage Timothy to be circumcised as, an, as a grown man to be circumcised just because of the gospel. Just because of the gospel. If it meant for him to walk, if it meant for him to support himself, whatever it meant, Paul was willing to do. Paul was saying, I am free, yet I made myself a slave. I am free, but I put myself in bondage just for the gospel's sake. But we look at our generation today, similar to the Corinthian church, our generation is different. And that influence of the society is so much on the church. In looking at this, I wanted to quickly look at three quick things before I round up and before we have the communion. 
the, the Christian, every Christian have three enemies, three main enemies. We have three main enemies as Christians. And we, as we have the Holy Trinity, we have the unholy Trinity as well. No, anything that God is doing, Satan wants to counterfeit. So the enemies of the Christian is number one, the world. The world. Number two, the flesh. And thirdly, Satan himself. That's the unholy trinity. The three work together to fight and war against the Christian. Number one, the world. The world is the whole value system which dominates society and is contrary to the ways of God. The world is the man-centered way of life which ignores God and operates by selfish principles and lives by ungodly standards. It is controlled by Satan, who is the God of this world. The world wants to pressure us to pattern our lives after its values. And unfortunately, many Christians are influenced. You say, oh, that's how it is done. The question is, who does it that way? Who, who, from who is that from? They, how that's or how everybody does it? No, that's how the world does it. Is that how Jesus would do it? Is that how the word of God prescribes? So this is important. We're in the world, the Bible says, but we are not of the world. When they say we are not of the world, it doesn't mean we are not of the physical world. We are not of the, the world, the value system of the world, the invisible world. Because the world is controlled by Satan. The Bible says, Jesus said, in John chapter 14, verse 30, I don't have much time to talk to you because the ruler of the world approaches. He has no power over me. So the ruler of the world system is Satan. The ruler of the world system, the value system of the world, the ruler, the controller is Satan. And we see again, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, Satan, who is the God of this world? has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the gospel, of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Satan is the God of the world. Satan is the one behind. All the movement we see, all the movement in the society, we see a lot of young people now, um, even older people in various classes, they, with their, they run to a particular direction. Many of them don't even understand why they run. Many people go and protest. They don't even know the real reason. They, they don't understand. It. There is a system. There is a, a world system. There is a power behind all this movement that many people don't understand that is driving people and people just join the bandwagon and go. A Christian shouldn't be like that. When the world, we don't allow the world to shape us. Instead, the Bible expects us to shape the world. To shape the world. That's why we are ensure to receive grace, to, re to be equipped, to be strengthened, to receive power, to shape and to influence the world. The, the one of the members of the unholy trinity is the world. Secondly, the flesh. The flesh is our human nature with its natural tendency to sin. The word flesh refers to a falling self-centered nature, sometimes called the old man or the Adamic nature. If you look at first um, if you look at Romans 7, verse 19 to 24, I do not, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do, this I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, inner being, I delight in, the, in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. For what a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. If in those verses, there are at least 20. I, me, or my there. This is talking about the flesh that is the closest of the three to us and is the most difficult to deal with. The fallen nature that Jesus came to rescue us from. This is what Paul was addressing when he was talking about putting his own right down. If you would read from verse 24 of First um, Corinthians 9, he was talking about how he put his body under so that after he's preached to others, he himself will not be a castaway. He wasn't talking about being saved by his effort or discipline. He was talking about 
the, what is required to keep the Christian discipline to put the flesh in its place, it requires you to make up your mind you are not going to live under the, the rule of the flesh. Satan, every believer, that's the third and the overall head of the unholy trinity. Satan, every believer, believing Christian, is subjected to the influences of the world from without. Also, we are subjected to the persuasion, persuasions of the flesh from within. But Satan uses the allurement of the world and the appeal of the flesh to try to get us to do what God does not want us to do. So Paul here was addressing this. to say, Even though we have the right, we have the freedom that Christ has made us free, do not allow the world system, do not allow the flesh, do not allow Satan to make you exercise those rights over and above the law of love for others. Do not allow Satan to make you exercise this right in such a way that it will hinder somebody else coming to Jesus. Do not allow the world system, do not allow the system of the world to make you elevate your right and your freedom over the gospel of Jesus. And all the things we call controversial in the faith, in the church, they're actually not controversial if we bind ourselves to the law of love. So the God of this world is, the God of this world is Satan. God is calling us to reject this world. He's calling us to reject the rule of of the flesh. He's calling us to be enslaved by the law of love. Because if we are enslaved by the law of love, we will think first, we will consider first what I'm doing, the life I'm living, how does it affect somebody else in coming to Jesus? That would be our priority. So what is the system of this world? How, what, is, what is the value of this world? The value of this world, the God of this world is I. In the society we live in, it's me first. It's I, me, myself. That is what it is. Have you heard things like this before? If it makes you happy, it doesn't have to make sense to others. If it makes you happy, no one else's opinion matters. Forget about what everyone else says. If it makes you happy, go for it. If it makes you happy, it can be bad. Okay? So this is the world system. The world, what the world thinks about is you. Is you. Is yourself. And the world wants the, us as Christians to live by this as well. But Paul is encouraging us, we should not allow the flesh, we should not allow the world to dictate to us, to elevate ourselves above the gospel. To elevate ourselves above what is required, above what, above preaching of the gospel, above the law of love. The law of love is the first love. is the first law. And that is what Paul is encouraging. Whatever it takes him, Paul was ready to do. He was ready to offer himself. He was ready to put his, his rights down. So the encouragement today and in this passage is for us to whatever right we have, that for us as Christians, whatever we want to do, the first consideration, how does this help the gospel? How does this hinder the gospel? There is something I've been wanting to do for a long time, but every time I think about it, I just can't get myself to do it. How is this going to come across? How is this going to influence somebody? How is it going to affect somebody? Even though I'm free to do it, I have the right to do it. There's nothing in God that I say, don't do it. But I keep asking myself. I can't get myself to do it. Is this something that will help somebody? How does this affect the gospel? How do, what message does this pass across? And this is the believer's life. The believer's life is to put our right, to put our freedom at the altar and ask Jesus to bind us to the law of love for others. And some people say, say, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me as long as my conscience doesn't condemn me, as long as I'm happy, as long as I'm okay with it. No, we have to think about how does this affect the gospel. And Paul said in Galatians chapter 2 verse 21, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live in the flesh. In, I, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith 
in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul said his flesh has been crucified. He no longer lived. It was Christ. 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 It was the gospel that mattered. Nothing else counts. If we, we have been for some time, I've been thinking and considering, looking at the church, the early church. I've been considering why is our church? I mean, when I say our church, I don't mean this church in particular. Why is the church not as impactful as the early church? And one of the reasons, one of the reasons is our, our willingness to put our freedom and right on the altar, to live for the gospel. Everything that we do, the consideration for the gospel comes first. So Paul says here, nothing mattered. He's been crucified with Christ. He didn't live. It was Christ that lived and the life he lived in the, in the flesh. He lived by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. As we approach uh, the time to take the communion, I wanted to read to us Philippians chapter 2 from verse 6 to 8. If the worship team can please come forward. Please. I'm just going to read Philippians chapter 2 from verse 6 to 8. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. And this is an example of Jesus that is inviting us to. As we take the communion today, this is, the, this is what I would like us to reflect on. That Jesus did not cling to his... I didn't understand this passage for a long time. It took me time to understand it, the first part. So though he was God, he didn't think equality with God as something to cling to. For him to save us, he had to relinquish. He had to jettison his equality with God for him to come down to save us. That was what was required for him to be a savior, for him to rescue us. Verse 7, instead he gave up his divine privileges. We have privileges as Christians. We have rights as Christians. That Jesus Christ himself, he put down his rights and privileges just because he wanted to come to save us. What are we putting down? What right are we putting down for us to be effective, for us to live the gospel? What rights, what freedom are we putting down? This is the question God is asking us, and this is why I've read this passage for us to reflect on this as we take the communion. What is God asking you to put on, on the altar? What is God asking you to lay down? What is God asking you to give up? The lady asked us, uh, Lizzie, asked us this morning, which uncomfortable place is God calling you to go to be able to reach out? Which uncomfortable place? And I will ask the same question. The reason why we can't go to the uncomfortable place is because of the world, Satan, and the flesh. And God is calling us to reject the three of them, to reject the unholy trinity. Where is God calling you to? And this passage spoke a lot to me in preparation for this. What is God calling you to? What is God asking you to put on the, on the altar for you to be effective? For you to live the gospel. God wants us to live the gospel. He wants us to live the gospel everywhere, to live the gospel. That the most important thing to us is not our right, it's not our freedom, it's the gospel, wherever we go. Let me pray before uh, we go into the communion. For our sakes, Jesus, you lay down your right. For our sake, Jesus, you gave up your equality, your divine right, your equality with God, so you can save us, so you can reach us. Lord, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for just offering yourself for us, giving us an example. I just ask you, Lord, that this morning, just help us. Just open our hearts to things you want us to lay down at the altar. Just for us to live the gospel. Just for us to be a witness. For us to be a true follower of Jesus. Open our hearts and eyes. Lord, I ask, oh God, that you would help us 
that our life will be all about the gospel, just like Paul. Not our rights, not our privileges, not our freedom, but the gospel. And whatever it takes, if it takes like Paul, not eating me, all the days of our lives, just because of the gospel, we will do it. Whatever it takes, Lord, I just pray you give us, you fill us with your spirit, fill us with grace, so we can live the gospel. I ask you, Lord, that you will reveal Jesus to us afresh, and the price you paid afresh to us as we go into the communion, as we go to remember what you've done for us on the cross. We praise you. Just help us to live different in the world. Help us to reject the value of the world. Help us to reject the flesh. Help us to reject Satan for us to live for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.